name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. And so the church fathers for 2,000 years talked about two things more than any other. Mary and the Eucharist. Now out of 40,000 Christian denominations, Methodist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, all of them, how many of them have Mary and the Eucharist? One, Catholics. That's it. For 1,500 years until the Protestant Reformation, what the church fathers wrote about, the entire early Christians, more than anything else, Mary and the Eucharist. What two things are only Catholic? Mary and the Eucharist. That is why I am a Marian father, because the only thing we Marians focus on is Mary and the Eucharist. Divine mercy through the Eucharist. This is why I'm a Marian. And so every Mass is a miracle. Every time that priest elevates that piece of bread and it becomes the body and blood of Christ, you have a miracle. But sometimes God allows more to be seen to the human eye. And sometimes it's even given to saints, like this one, Saint Faustina. Saint Faustina refers to the Eucharist throughout her diary. She wrote 16 different prayers about the Eucharist. In Diary 1037, she says, The Eucharist gives me all my bodily and spiritual strength. Do you know, um, do we have any Portuguese people here with us? I met a couple last night. There is a special, oh, do we? Yes, yes, yes. You guys were there last night, right? Yeah. There's a special saint, Alex Drina. You ever heard of her? She was, she fell out of a window trying to avoid being raped and she jumped out of a window and she was paralyzed they have documentation that she lived only on the Eucharist for 30 years you can't do that if it's just a piece of one little disc of bread 30 years and they have it documented because she was bedridden and they know what they gave her they have it documented. They know what they gave her to eat. She couldn't walk. She couldn't go out and get her own Jolly Bees, which I had in the Philippines. That's what I, I that's where I was experienced Johnny Jolly Bees the first time. It was in the Philippines. And so this is what the Eucharist is. In fact, St. Faustina, my favorite passage in the diary, diary 1804, one of them. St. Faustina says, if the angels were capable of envy, they would only envy man for two things. One, that we can suffer. Wow, that doesn't sound like something you would want to envy, does it? The reason why? Because Christ suffered, and when we suffer, we imitate Christ. So they would envy. The angels don't suffer. Why? Why? They're only spirit. We are body and spirit. And second, what is the second reason that St. Faustina said if the angels were capable of envy, they would envy us? Because we can receive Holy Communion. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. Now, let's get started. One of the earliest recorded Eucharistic miracles ever was in Egypt with the Desert Fathers. They were the first monks. Anybody of you here ever hear about this miracle? Raise your hand. Okay, nobody. Wow. 
Now, one of the monks had doubts about the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Notice that all the church, since the Last Supper, believed in the real presence of the Eucharist, and now only 30% of Catholics do? We're going in the wrong direction. And so one of them had doubts. Now, two of his fellow monks fully believed, and they prayed for their third friend monk, that his faith would be strengthened. And so they all attended Mass. Now, when the bread was placed on the altar, all three priests saw a small child appear. You know what's interesting? St. Faustina explains the exact same thing. That a little child all the time would appear on that altar during Mass. Faustina saw it all the time. These three monks saw it. Now, the priest who did not believe, when he reached out his hand to break the bread, an angel came down from heaven with a sword. Now, when that priest cut the bread into small pieces, guess what that angel did? Now, here's an angel coming down from heaven. You got this little child. We're assuming right now it's Christ's child, right? Here comes this angel with a sword. What do you think that angel did with the sword? He slew the red dragon, right? Like Revelation. He slew Satan, right? No. He cut the child into pieces with that sword. The two monks were like, whoa. And the monk who didn't believe watched as the angel poured the child's blood into a chalice. This is all documented. All of this. And when they received, the skeptical priest was the only one they received something that looked like bread. The other two that believed, but this priest who didn't believe, literally received a piece of bloody flesh from the cut child with the sword. He looked at the bloody flesh and saw the other two priests had bread, or what looked like bread, and then he watched his bread turn into this bloody flesh. And he screamed out, Lord, I now believe that this bread is your flesh and this chalice is your blood. Forgive me. Have mercy on me. Immediately, the flesh turned back into bread. Now, was it just bread? No, it looks like bread. It tastes like bread, but what is it? It's the body and blood of Christ. Now he believed. And he took it, gave thanks to God, and consumed it. And the other two priests said, God knows human nature and that man cannot eat raw flesh. And that is why he has changed his body into bread and his blood into wine for those who receive it in faith. He was receiving the true presence. Amazing. Now, the Real Presence Association in Rome is translating reports from 120 Vatican-approved miracles. Now, a faith, as I said, should not be based on miracles. But sometimes, miracles alone, we shouldn't base our faith. But sometimes God allows these miracles to strengthen our faith. What you're about to hear tonight, if you don't come out of here with a complete, full belief that Jesus is present in this Eucharist, I, I'll have Father buy you a steak dinner. <laughs> because I'm so sure of that. Now, one of my favorite Eucharistic miracles, I'm going to tell you a couple short ones before I get into the big one, took place in France. 
in Avignon. Ironically, the same place as the real pope when there was a discrepancy of the, of the papacy. This is in 1433, and there was a small church that the Franciscans ran that was doing adoration when some great floods came. And the whole church was flooded, and the whole town was flooded, and two friars, two Franciscans, rode a boat to the church. They couldn't even walk. They were certain that the church was submerged and was destroyed. But when they got there, the water, although the water was all around the church, four feet high, and the water went into the church, guess what happened? And this is an actual drawing of it. Now, if you see the two sides, it kind of looks like two snow banks. That's the water. The water parted. And this is an actual drawing from the monks, or the friars. That is the actual parting of the water. The water was four foot high. And they walked right up the middle, and right in the middle there, guess what that is? That's an altar, and the Eucharist is on the altar, untouched. So although the water in the church was four feet high, a pathway from the doorway to the altar was perfectly dry and the sacred host was untouched. Amazing. This is documented. But let's get to the main one I want to talk about tonight. How many of you here have heard about the Eucharistic miracle in Buenos Aires in 1996? Have you heard this story? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I'm going to show you some new things I just discovered recently about this. So if you saw my talk online, there's going to be some new things. All right, now, a true Eucharistic miracle, I said, happens at every Mass when the priest utters the words of consecration, but sometimes God makes it more visible. Like with Archbishop Bergoglio. Who's Archbishop Bergoglio? Pope Francis. In 1996, he was in Buenos Aires. Now, at a local church there, the priest was told that a consecrated host had been desecrated and was on a candle holder in the back of the church. Now, this is sad, because if the priest could not consume it, that means it was desecrated in a pretty vile way. Like maybe excrement was put on it or something. I mean, just horrible. He could not consume it. When a host falls to the floor, I consume it. If, if there's any kind of abuse, like we have found hosts inside the uh, music hymnals in the parish, in the pews, we have found consecrated hosts inside our prayer hymnals in our pews. You know Satanists? You know this? Before you can become a high wizard, in the satanic church, they put you to a test. Isn't this unbelievable? 30% of Catholics believe God is present in the Eucharist. You know how many Satanists believe that God is present in the Eucharist? 100%. So before you can become a high wizard, they will take 100 hosts and put them on a table 99 are unconsecrated. One is consecrated. And before you can become a high wizard, you got to pray for the power of evil. And that power of evil will enter you, and they will be able to identify immediately which one of those hosts is consecrated. Because the devil knows God is real. Now, how do you think they got that consecrated host? How do they get it? They steal it. I ask all of you, please be vigilant if you are at the Mass. And sometimes the priests are so focused on distributing, they don't even see when they hand it to somebody in the hand. This is why I'm in favor of communion on the tongue. But they put it in the hand and they're on to the next one and, and these people walk away. They don't consume it. And sometimes they walk out with it. This is how they get it. 
uh-uh, not me. I watch every single person, if they want to receive in the hand, that they consume it. Not long ago, I was at the shrine just like this, and I'm distributing Holy Communion, and a woman comes up. She puts her hands out, and her eyes rolled back in her head. Her head snapped back, snapped forward, and her eyeballs went back. I was not going to give her Holy Communion. And then I thought, well, maybe she just has a medical condition. Trust me, she's got a medical condition. And I put the host in her hand, and I watch her walk away, and she puts the host in her pocket. And she starts heading to the back, out the side, like you guys have here at this design of your parish. And I go, ma'am, excuse me. She didn't look back. She kept walking. I said, ma'am, excuse me. I know she heard me because she started running. And I, boom, I was gone. I, even with the people waiting to receive Holy Communion, I flew down that aisle. She ran out the door. I said, ma'am, ma'am. She was ignoring me. And I said, ma'am, I says, please hand me the host. And she says, I'm going to eat it in the parking lot. I said, no. She says, yes, I'm going to eat it outside. I says, no, ma'am. And so I said, you're going to please hand me back the host. And she looked at me with these crazy eyes. She quick grabbed it and she quick ate it. I hope that God gave her some grace through that Eucharist. But I am convinced that that woman had evil influences and was going to take that host for evil, evil purposes. So please, watch when you are at Mass. I'm not asking you to be a cop, but if you see somebody in front of you, if you're in line, and you see somebody take it and put it in their pocket and walk away, please, tell an usher. And so, this is basically what we have to be aware of that's happening. So anyway, um, they were unable, this priest was unable to consume the host. This is back, now let's go back to the story here in Argentina. So what is the proper way to dispose of a Eucharist that you cannot consume? You dissolve it in water. So he put it into a glass of water and put it in the tabernacle. So just, just like this, praise be to God, that's the proper place for a tabernacle, not in some broom closet. So he put the glass of water in the tabernacle with the host in it to dissolve. Now, what happened? When they opened the tabernacle eight days later, expecting that host to be dissolved, the host not only did not dissolve, it was transformed. It was now a piece of bloody tissue, much larger than the original host. And it was decided that they were going to keep the host in the tabernacle. They didn't want to publicize it. They didn't want to draw a bunch of attention. They didn't want to say where it came from. So I know this was real. Because they did not want to broadcast it. They weren't like, hey, let's create a miracle and call in the news media. So after, guess what? Three years. Three years. This bloody piece of tissue had not decomposed. This is extraordinary and basically impossible to understand because there was no special attempt to preserve it. It was not put in some hermetically sealed container. The tabernacle was not air sealed or airtight. They didn't freeze it. It was sitting there. And it didn't decompose. This is impossibly to explain for a piece of bread or a piece of flesh. So guess what happened? At that point, a friend of our Marian community, this man, Dr. Ricardo Castagnon Gomez, got involved. Now, does anybody recognize where he's speaking from? That's the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, where I live. I got this story firsthand from Dr. Castagnon. 
What I'm about to share with you is one of the most amazing stories I've ever heard in my whole life. And he was the one. He took a sample because he is a PhD doctor. He's a neuroscientist and a cardiologist. And he took a sample of the bloody fragment because he heard what happened at this church and he sent it to New York City. Now, since Gomez did not want the studies to be prejudiced, because if they heard it was from the Catholic Church, they would, they would do something, probably not accept it or falsify the studies, whatever. So he did not want them to be prejudiced. So the scientific community, community or the committee that would be examining this tissue in New York, he did not tell them the source. He did not tell them what it was. Now, did they know it was the Eucharist? No, because it didn't even look like bread anymore. You know what it looked like? A piece of human flesh. It was bloody. It was a piece of bloody meat. So he sent it to them without telling them the source. And the scientists, the one lab scientist analyzing it, looked at it and said, oh my, we have a murder. We have a murder. Why? Because all the properties of that flesh showed that it was under stress and it was removed from a victim that had experienced severe trauma. And it was taken when the victim was alive. So a team of five scientists were assembled, including the famous cardiologist and forensic pathologist named Dr. Frederick Zugaby. He's the author of many books on forensic pathology. And I'm going to read you his words of testimony. These are not my words. These are his words. After studying this sample that was sent to them from Buenos Aires, he said, the material is a fragment of human heart muscle found in the wall of the left ventricle. This muscle is responsible for the contraction of the heart. The left cardiac ventricle pumps blood to all parts of the body. What's the church? Oh, come on. The body of Christ. What is Christ giving? His blood, his body. His body, his blood, he's giving it to his church. It makes sense. So they tested this. It was the left ventricle, or the left cardial, cardiac ventricle that pumps blood to all parts of the body. This is what this piece of flesh was. It's the heart muscle. Then they discovered that this heart muscle was in an, in an inflammatory condition. And it contains many white blood cells. Why is that important? No living tissue can have white blood cells survive more than 20 minutes outside of a living organism. If I was to come up to you tonight, or you come up to me, that's more likely, and cut me, and you pull out a piece of my heart, for 20 minutes, it will show white blood cells. White blood cells indicate that it is alive. After about 15 minutes in the air, they die. This sample was three years old and had living white blood cells. This indicates that the heart was alive at the time the sample was taken. So now the scientists are baffled. We have a murder. 
He said, it's my contention that the heart was alive at the time the sample was taken because white blood cells die outside of a living organism. The white blood cells had also penetrated the tissue, which indicates that the heart had been under severe stress as if the owner had been beaten severely about the chest. This is the words of Dr. Zugaby. He doesn't even know what he's talking about. Who do you know that had a heart under severe stress as if they were beaten severely about the chest? Jesus. Now, this totally eliminates the possibility of fraud that some critic might come up with because it cannot be thought that the officials in the church had authorized the torture and death of a 30 to 35 year old male that's what they tested it with AB blood type I'm going to get to that in a minute that's the same kind of blood on the Shroud of Turin opened his chest while he was still alive after torturing him and removed the tissue from his beating heart. There's just no way that some little 80-year-old priest in Argentina did that. They're trying to figure out New York City where this came from. They asked, how did this piece of tissue make its way here? Well, Dr. Castignon knew but he asked the question, how did that piece of tissue get into the tabernacle? Well, solid medical evaluation showed that the sample had not decomposed at all and could also not be received from a dead person, like a cadaver. Because the properties of a dead person versus the properties of a live person, if you were to cut out a piece of their heart, are different. They knew from study that this was not a cadaver. Not that somebody went into the morgue and cut a piece of heart out. Now, Dr. Castignon did something amazing. I, I, to me, when he told this story, I, 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 it, it's beyond belief. But Dr. Castignon flew to New York City, and he got on the docket to be a speaker at some scientific symposium in New York City with a bunch of doctors and scientists, just like I'm speaking to you here tonight. And he got on the docket for 10 minutes, and so he gets up to speak, and guess what he does? He puts up a picture on a screen, just like this, of a piece of bread. Then he showed a Catholic priest, and then he showed the Eucharistic prayer from the Mass. And Dr. Cassignon He's looking out at all these doctors and scientists and he says, you give me a piece of bread, a Catholic priest, and this Eucharistic prayer, and I will give you human heart tissue. All of the people in the scientists and the, and the doctors in the crowd, you could hear this rumble. So one guy stands up, he says, is this a joke? We don't got time for this nonsense. Dr. Castignon said, stop, I got 10 minutes. I got 10 minutes. So they sat back down, and he goes back up and he says again, you give me a piece of bread, a Catholic priest, and this Eucharistic prayer, and I will give you human heart tissue. They all laughed. So then he blew their doors away. He had sent a piece of that tissue to three different independent labs in New York. And he pointed to the person, 
the first person, and he said, Dr. Jacobs, I sent your lab, because he was the head of the lab, a piece of bread prayed over by a Catholic priest using this Eucharistic prayer, because Dr. Castagnon had evidence that where that sample came from, they had it all documented, and your lab told me it was human heart tissue. He said, all of a sudden, it was totally silent. Then he said, Dr. Williams, I sent your lab a piece of bread, prayed over by a Catholic priest, using this Eucharistic prayer, and your lab told me it was human heart tissue. I got your report right here. Silence. Then he got to the big dog, Dr. Zugaby. And he said, Dr. Zugaby, pathologic, or forensic pathologist, I sent your lab a piece of bread, prayed over by a Catholic priest, using this Eucharistic prayer, and you personally told me it is human heart tissue. I got all the reports documenting that this was a piece of bread. Dead silence. You could have heard a pin drop. So I asked Dr. Castignon, why don't more scientists spread the message that this is real? When they saw the evidence that this piece of bread became human heart tissue, why do not more scientists call up the news media? Why don't more of them do it? And he says, you know why? Because then they'd have to become Catholic. <laughs> I was like, wow. But it's true. It's true. Now, you know how we finished his talk, Dr. Cassignon said, I want to share with you some common scientific findings about all Catholic Eucharistic miracles. Most of those people have never heard of a Catholic Eucharistic miracle, like you're about to hear right now. He said, the blood has hemoglobin and DNA of human origin. All Eucharistic blood bleeding hosts have hemoglobin and DNA of human origin. In every Eucharistic miracle ever tested that was approved, the substance originated the blood from the interior, excluding that it could have been placed from the exterior. In other words, let's suppose I want to say to Father Don Calloway, hey, Father Don, let's get some news media here. You cut your finger Put some blood on this host, and I'll scream miracle. Well, there's a difference. They know in science, when blood comes from the exterior, it has different properties than the blood of your interior. It's oxidized when it hits the air. So the interior blood is what we have, excluding that it could ever have been put there from the exterior. Now, the blood type is always AB positive. Now, is AB positive the universal receiver or the universal donor? No! It's the universal receiver. And this makes perfect sense, and I'm going to explain it to you in a moment. This is similar to all the other studies done. Like you see on your screen, this is Lanciano, the medical report done by Dr. Linoli. I accidentally on a uh, talk said cannoli, and I got the meanest letters. I was like, it was an honest mistake. And so, similar to the hosts at Lanciano on the shroud, all the blood is AB positive. 
In every Eucharistic miracle, studies revealed that the tissue found, as I said, corresponds to the heart, the muscle of the heart, the myocardium. The very fact that the outer part of the blood coagulated, dried for years, while the inner part of the blood is fresh and continues to effuse fresh blood is unexplainable. Why? Because this blood has been separated from a living being for centuries, but it continues to bleed fresh blood. How? The only way it can effuse fresh blood is if it's attached to a living being. This, these blood samples have been in glass containers for centuries, and they still continue to bleed fresh blood. How is this possible? Now, furthermore, the blood contains proteins that indicate there was elevated metabolism from the person the blood came from, like it was during trauma. Look at this report. That's an actual photo of a Eucharistic miracle. Can you see the bloody hosts? This was a Eucharistic miracle on Christmas Day 2013, so they are still happening confirmed in Poland by Bishop, I have no idea how to pronounce that name, and by the Vatican. It said, the final medical statement by the Department of Forensic Medicine found that, quote, in the histopathological image, the fragments of the host were found containing the fragmented parts of the cross steriated muscle. It is most similar to the heart muscle. Tests also determined the tissue to be of human origin and found that it bore signs of distress. They're all the same. Every approved miracle. This is amazing. Now here's one of the most amazing. You all remember your biology class? Now, how many chromosomes do you have? to determine your sex? How many? Two. And that's not by coincidence. Now, who or what chromosome is supplied by the mother? The X. No matter what. Mom always supplies the X chromosome. Now what does the dad supply? If you have a world of boys. If the dad supplies an X, you have an X from the mom, an X from the dad, and you have two X's, you have a girl. Now if the dad supplies a Y, you have an X from the mom, and a Y from the dad, and you have a Boy, sorry, there's only two. There is no more. You are either an XX or an XY, even when one is not dominant and the other one is, and there's all kinds of medical, you still, even in people who don't have perfect chromosomes, there is a dominant one to show they are male or female, even if their exterior genitalia isn't. Even if they are born without exterior genitalia, their chromosomes will tell you if they are male or female. So, in every blood sample taken in a Eucharistic miracle, every one, guess what? In a female, you have an XX. Mom supplies the X, dad supplies the X, you have a female, it's a girl. In the other case, you have mom supply the X, dad supplies the Y, you have an XY, you have a boy. In every case of the Eucharistic miracles accepted by the church, there is no Y chromosome. There is only the X chromosome. What does that mean? There's no earthly father. This has never been seen before. In every blood sample of the Eucharistic miracles, there is only an X chromosome. There either has to be an XX or an XY. 
Jesus was a man. There should have been an X and a Y if he had an earthly father. His samples of these blood tests show, or these blood miracles on the bleeding host, show there's no Y chromosomes, which means there was no earthly father. Who was Jesus? He had no earthly father. This is amazing. This is incredible. This is a Eucharistic miracle. Even St. Faustina talks about this. Now, what I want to do right here, let's take a quick break, because when we come back, I'm going to show you an incredible video that you did not see when I did these talks before, because I just found it recently. I'm going to show you the most amazing video of a new Eucharistic miracle that just happened. So let's take a five-minute break, stretch, get up, but don't leave. Come back because we want to see this video. Okay, everybody, let's try to come back. Let's try to come back, everybody. Now, um, I want to give one quick announcement before we show the video. Um, I've been doing on first Saturdays on our Explain in the Faith series that you can find on YouTube. And I have been doing on our EWTN show. If you haven't seen our EWTN show, it's called Living Divine Mercy. On the East Coast of the United States, it's on 6.30 on Wednesdays and 9 a.m. coming up brand new slot, which I'm not sure where, at what time it's broadcast here. It is 3.30 on, on Wednesdays? Okay, so you all have homework to watch 3.30 on Wednesdays on EWTN, Living Divine Mercy. We've got some amazing shows. It's only half an hour. And, and when you take out the ending commercials, it's not even that. And I've talked about Marian apparitions, apparitions in the church. And on my Explaining the Faith talk, I've talked about Lourdes, La Salette, Fatima, Akita, Nock, uh, Bahrain, all these. But I have never in my life seen or read of a greater apparition than Einzelden. If you have not heard of this apparition, because it was not just a Marian apparition, it was an apparition of the entire court of heaven. The entire court of heaven revealed itself in the greatest apparition in the history of the church. Now, in the terms of significance, yes, Fatima, Lourdes, La Salette are greater. But in the terms of just pure awe, there is nothing greater, in my opinion, than Einzelden. It's in Switzerland. And we are going to be leading, I am leading, I don't do pilgrimages very much. But on April 9th of next year to the 20th, with Deacon Harold Sivers, I will be leading a pilgrimage to Vienna, to Munich, the nations of Austria, and then Germany, Bavaria, and then into Switzerland. And when I gave that report of the actual example of what happened at Einzelden, I, I literally couldn't fight back the tears. When you read what happened there, how the entire heavenly court came down into this little chapel, St. Peter, St. Paul, the 12 apostles, St. Augustine, St. John Chrysostom, and then followed by the Blessed Mother, and then in all his splendor, the King of Peace himself, Jesus Christ, came down and celebrated Mass in this little chapel that we're going to.
If you'd like to join us, we are going on April 9th, two days after Divine Mercy Sunday. And if you'd like more information, you can go, I'm going through select international tours. You can contact them, or you can contact my assistant Peter at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. He has a super easy email. It's just Peter James. So one word, Peter James at Marian.org. M-A-R-I-A-N dot O-R-G. If you would like to join us on this pilgrimage, because I, I said when I gave that talk, before I die, I have got to go there. So praise be to God, I'm going there. And we'd like you to join us. Again, April 9th for 12 days to all those beautiful locations. I've never looked forward to anything before like this. And we'd love to meet you, have dinner with you, have you join us. We'd love you to be part of it. And if you want information, I have the flyer. You can come see me at the table. I'm going to sign books. So if you can get a book before you leave, I'll sign it for you. But if you want to come and get the information, you can take a picture of this on your phone, and then you could have the email and the phone number, okay? But please, we'd love you to join us. Speaking of books, um, I have my books here and DVD, and we'll, we'll talk about that at the end. All right, now, what do I want to talk about here is something amazing. All right, you all know that traditional prayer, Jesus, make my heart like unto thine. Y'all heard that? Well, let me tell you, it's literally true. Why? When we say at Mass, what's called right before the Eucharistic prayer, the preface. The preface is, I say to you, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Okay, notice what I said. Lift up your hearts. Guess what, everybody? God is asking you to lift up your heart because he's getting ready to give you a heart transplant. You give him your stony, hardened heart. So when you come to Mass, when I say lift up your hearts, you tear your heart out, offer up on that patent when that priest lifts up the patent, put your hardened, stony heart on that patent, offer it back up to God, and he's going to give you a heart transplant. How? In the Eucharist, because what did we just say the Eucharist was literally? Heart tissue. Whose heart? Jesus. He's going to give you a heart transplant. If you let him, no doctor will do a heart transplant without your permission. Jesus can give you a new heart. All you got to do to do is come to Mass to receive it. But do you want it? Uh, you say yes. Do you really want it? Okay. Then that means you got to soften that heart. That means you got to put love of your brother ahead of yourself. That means you got to put love of God as the number one thing in your life. Then you will have a new heart. This is amazing. Now, I'm going to show you a video that I did not have when I first did this talk on YouTube. Because it just happened in Guadalajara, Mexico in July of last year. And this is an actual, the actual video of what happened. Testing. Let's watch where this happened. So what you're seeing here is that the host is beating uh, like a heart. Se ven como tiene el movimiento de sístole y diástole y tienen los latidos del corazón al ritmo perfecto. 
So it has the beating of a heart per perfectly like a human heart. So a doctor measured the movement of, of this heart and he said it, it corresponds to the beating of a human heart. And a lady who had converted, had a strong conversion, she made communion and the host started to beat in her mouth. So it happened to that lady in her mouth and it's also happening outside that the, the, the host exposed in the Eucharist is beating. The host in the Eucharist in that monstrance is beating. Can you see it? Did you see it pulsating? They had a cardiologist analyze the video and he said definitively that every beat of that host in that monstrance beat with the perfect rhythm of a human heart. This is a Eucharistic miracle. This is unbelievable. And this is what we have. Now let's go back to the blood for a moment. Remember I said, what was the blood type? AB positive. And is that the universal donor or receiver? receiver? Receiver. Why would it be the universal receiver rather than the universal donor? Why? Why would Jesus' blood be globally receptive instead of a universal donor? We all seem to think donor. No. Because when we receive the Eucharist, we commonly say, I received Jesus, right? I received Christ in Holy Communion. I received the precious blood. This means if you have the universal blood type, if you are the universal receiver, if you have AB positive blood, that means you can take in the blood type of any human being in the world and make it your own. Guess what Jesus does? He takes in every human being and makes them the, his own. This means that we, he takes us into him. This means that his body... If your body has AB blood, you can take the blood from any human being in this church. If you are the universal receiver, you can receive the blood of any human in this church and it becomes part of you. Guess what Jesus does? The body of Christ receives each and every one of us into his own body when we receive Holy Communion. We become part of him. When we take communion, it's less about Jesus becoming part of us. We always think when we receive Holy Communion, Jesus, you're now a part of me. No, you're now a part of him. This is amazing. It's less about Christ becoming part of us and more about us becoming part of him. And by extension, part of his body, which is the church. We are taken up into holy communion with him and one another. This is Lumen Gentium 7. St. Irenaeus said, our communicated flesh is not only nourished by Christ's body and blood, but it is also, in fact, a part of his body and blood. Christ as the universal receiver. That means his precious blood is capable of receiving your stained blood. No matter what blood type, the universal receiver can receive it. No matter what type of blood you got, sinful, stained. Do you know that that is why the Jews sacrificed animals? 
They sacrificed animals because they believed sin was so part of the human that it was in your blood. They killed the animal because blood had to be spilled because of sin. So they would sacrifice the animal and drain the blood. That's because the blood drained out the sin. That's why they eat kosher meat. The blood is drained from the animal. So your blood, even if it is stain-filled, God says, now I don't want the sacrifice of animals. I want mercy. And the mercy is him taking your stained blood. Now instead of it having to be spilled on the ground and you dying for your sins, why did Jesus die on the cross? Because the penalty for sin is death. When you sin or I sin, we deserve to die. But Jesus died in our place. He spilled the blood. So now you can become part of him. This is incredible. He took on the sins of the world so that no sinner is excluded from being taken up and being now part of his body. He is the universal receiver. Is that not amazing that every single Eucharistic miracle shows universal receiver AB positive? Whoa. And you know, this is, this is incredible. Because if we have this, we have to understand that in, you know, here's the thing, everybody. If these were hoaxes, how far back do these Eucharistic miracles go? Are they just in the last hundred years? They go back centuries. I just showed you Lunciano. That was 750 years ago. Now here's the point, everybody. That blood was taken from the host 750 years ago. How did they know 750 years ago that every time they faked a Eucharistic miracle, they had to get the same blood type? You know why that's impossible? They didn't even discover blood types to the 20th century. There was no understanding of blood types before the 20th century. None. Before the 20th century, blood was blood. So if there was a false, fake, Eucharistic miracle back in Avignon, France in 1433, or Lanciano 700 years ago, how did they all get AB positive blood? What a coincidence, right? No, because it's real. It cannot be false or there would have been one of those would have had a different blood type. If that blood came from an animal or some human putting their own blood on that host, eventually you would have had a different blood type. 